Hello. <laughs> First and foremost, I'd like to thank Ms. Dee Dee Shibley, um, Aaron Swenson, and the Beyond in Pink and Blue Conference and the countless volunteers who've put this event together for their time and for reaching out to me and including me in this discussion. Faith is complicated for me, filled with good and bad memories, love, joy, pain, and trauma. I often in my speeches say many of us in community are required to choose between our existence and our faith. Something that I very much so felt growing up. I'm going to take you through some of the good and the bad, but I'd like to begin with some of the more challenging times and bring you to where I am now. So please stay patient with me. Growing up in a repressive and very conservative culture was not easy for me. I was born into a family of first generation Muslim Indian immigrants in Chicago, Illinois in 1981. My family is of the Sunni denomination in Islam. Similar to Baptist, Methodist, um, Islam also has its own different denominations. Within that denomination, my particular subset of Islam is called Mahdavis. They're pretty much like the Jehovah's Witnesses of Islam, very, very strict and very, very conservative. Lucky me. <laughs> From a young age, we were taught the verses of the Quran, memorized passages and prayers. And by age seven to 10, most in my family had also completed their first fast during the holy month of Ramadan. I was taught to read Quran in Arabic, something we did every weekend with my father, and would get together with our extended families for faith-based gatherings pretty much every week. At the same time I was learning about religion, I was also learning that something was different about me. At my earliest, I can remember in the first grade or so, maybe about age six, being attracted to boys. Not in a sexual way, but in a way where little boys and girls are encouraged to have Valentines. I also very much wanted to wear girls' clothing, play with dolls, hang out with all of my girl cousins. It was very much a point of contention with my family. From quite a young age, my behavior was corrected with the quintessential passages from the Quran and every monotheistic religion for that matter, that men shall not don women's clothing or passages from Sodom and Gomorrah about how LGBTQ people were evil and destroyed by God. You see, something most people don't realize about Islam is that it's a continu continuation of faith. In other words, we believe in the Bible and the Torah and that each of these books and prophets, Jesus, Moses, were sent by God at the time that it was needed, ending with the prophet Muhammad. Meaning we have a lot of the same stories and beliefs. Noah's Ark, stories of Abraham, were all commonplace growing up. And I also learned very early that I need to keep my wishes to myself because they were not normal based on those stories. It was in middle school and teen years that things got very complicated. It was clear I was a woman. Once a year on Shabbat Barat, one of Islam's holiest nights, we are told that God will answer any prayers that you may ask. For multiple years on that night, I remember crying on my prayer mat, asking that God would make me a girl. If you would have told me, that child, that years later, I'd be a beautiful, successful, and happy woman. I don't think that I would have believed you. But you see, God works in mysterious ways. Hiding who I was became imperative during these years, and I was quite frightened for my life and my family's honor. South Asian culture rears children to grow up in guilt, similar to Catholicism. My best friend's Catholic, so trust me, I know. <laughs> We are constantly afraid of disappointing our families. The physical safety concern started as I heard my uncle say obnoxious things about gay people regularly. One year during the 1996 Olympics, a bunch of gay men and Daisy Dukes walked by and I remember thinking, work. <laughs> they, however, talked about how those men would be stoned to death if they were in Saudi Arabia. Then now I don't think my parents would have ever shipped me off to die 
As a teenager, I had an irrational fear that I'd be sent away if anybody ever found out about who I was. Dancing around, dressing up in girls' clothes, wearing my mom's heels in my room was my only solace. By age 14, I had tried to kill myself four times. Yet even in this action, I couldn't escape the fact that suicide was a mortal sin. It seemed there was no winning for me. But this is when things changed. My mom caught me on my last attempt, and we had a discussion. Her love for me is what saved me. Sometimes I think that God was working through her. We spent the next few years seeing a gender specialist who not only validated my feelings, but provided resources for me. And at 18, I started taking hormone blockers without my parents knowing, of course. <laughs> and I transitioned at 19. My extended family, about 45 people in the metro Atlanta area, stopped talking to me and still do not talk to me to this day. They use their faith as the basis for this excommunication. After this, in my mid 20s to 30s, I lost faith. I chose not to face the trauma that had created so much turmoil in my earlier life. The fact uh, that most people who loved me used religion to ostracize me made me feel like religion itself was to blame. Also, the guilt of not knowing how to pray as a pre op woman men and women pray separately and differently in Islam, had often overwhelmed me. I stayed in this space until my early 30s, when after my surgery, I finally felt comfortable praying. But by then I had lost most of my religious community. At this point, I was a successful, well-transitioned woman who had made a wonderful career and was stable in my life. Praying in, mor in the morning or at night, in bed, feeling grateful for all he had given me and reconnecting in my own way. It was then, just a few years ago, that something amazing had happened. I had been living my life in anonymity due to my passing privilege and many of the violent experiences I had in my younger years as a trans woman of color. Though I was out to a very small circle of friends, my real estate firm and even my in-laws did not know that I was trans. Trump had won, it was 2017, and we were constantly under attack. I was depressed for many reasons, including being unhappy in my marriage, family issues, national rhetoric, but more than anything else, not owning who I was as a person. All of a sudden, I started uh, waking up in the middle of the night, wide awake with thoughts, sometimes 12 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., I started penning my thoughts to get them out of my mind. Say what you will, but to me, this was the divine, God, light, or self-love speaking to me, whatever you may choose to call your higher power. Over about a month, it became clear as I looked at my writings what I needed to do. I needed to come out, to accept who I was, and tell the world, not for their acceptance, but for my own acceptance of me. I came out in a viral Facebook post on February 1st, 2018, and since then my life has changed immensely. Love, acceptance, and joy has flowed back into my life freely. I've become an activist and an advocate for my community, and trying to serve others has become an immense part of my personal faith. As I've nav navigated these amazing spaces of being out, I've also reconnected to Islam. Finding organizations I never knew existed, like Muslims for Progressive Values, a local LGBTQ mosque, and being able to pray with my immediate family. I've learned the amazing history of trans femmes in Islam, going back hundreds of years, maybe thousands, knowing that we were the ones who held the keys to Mecca, Medina, and the Kaaba. I'm on a journey of reconnecting with my spirit, my body, and my faith like never before. Part of this healing has been finding other amazing queer and trans folks who share my culture and my faith and creating new spaces for me to explore my spirituality. I'll end with this. As I began this speech, I said we often choose between our existence and our faith. Or sorry, we have to choose between our existence and our faith. But that's not true. 
we are told that we have to choose between our faith and our existence. You see, God, Allah, Buddha, Jesus, that divine light, whatever you call that higher power, that light exists in all of us. You just have to have the courage to listen to your faith and connect with the light that exists in each of us and each and every one of you. My hope is that my personal story of reconnecting with my faith and my spirituality might help some of those of you who are struggling with yours. Thank you so much for having me. My name again is Faroza Syed, and I'm a local trans activist and advocate based in the Atlanta area. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak with all of you today. Thank you.